This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 151 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm speaking to one of my oldest friends, Susie Speaks, all about social media management for authors. And I am coming to you live from South Africa. I So if the audio is a little odd, that is why I'm not in my normal uh, office, which has some acoustic dampening because of the very monstrous bookcase that I have. And I'm in a studio apartment with very little furniture. So it's probably a little bit echoey today and it might possibly be next week as well because I will still be in South Africa. Although by the time you hear the following episode, I will be uh, back home at that point. So, uh, to last week's question, which was, what bestseller would you like to deconstruct? CJ Dainton said, such a fun episode. I'd probably deconstruct uh, Lincoln in the Bardo. SL uh, Ager Author said, or SL Ager Author said, great interview, loved yours with Joanna Penn. Thank you. Yes, I was on Joanna Penn's podcast. I will tell you about that in my personal update. Arabelle said, absolutely loved this episode. So excited to get my teeth into this book with the bestseller of choice already started it Whoa, that makes me nervous <laughs> sarah snipe said question i love the idea of uh, the rebel readers masterclass digging through books like you mentioned in the podcast will that continue or will you be moving to a different type of class can you say what that is so the rebel readers masterclass is going to continue for the foreseeable future we do a minimum of four classes a year we often do um, movie nights attached to the books if there are movies connected to the books um and in terms of whether or not i'm going to be doing a uh a, a proper course a full course connected to the anatomy of a bestseller i have ideas i definitely have ideas whether or not i have the time <laughs> that is the real question so uh yes i have thought about it i even have a structure for the course but uh, i am undecided as yet whether or not i actually have the time to uh, do it so this week's question is what has surprised you recently so the surprise for me <laughs> and I'm probably going to sound very stupid now, is that uh, here in the Southern Hemisphere in South Africa, the moon is not the same way (laughs) as it is in the Northern Hemisphere. And that that thought had never occurred to me until I looked up, or until my wife looked up and went, oh, the moon doesn't look right. And then I looked up and then preceded a googling to discover that of course when you're on a spherical object object the moon is going to look different from different uh, points on that ball so that is what surprised me and i would like to know what surprised you recently the book recommendation of the week this week is how to write a successful series writing strategies for authors by helen b Scheura. now helen has been a guest on the show and is going to be a guest on the show talking all about this very topic um and that is coming up very very soon but as this episode goes live her book will have just launched i read it i adored it i got to read um a beat copy or an arc copy i can't quite remember now it's fantastic it is jam-packed full and she also has some amazing goodies uh if you sign up to her mailing list as well so i highly highly recommend you go and check out this book if you want to write a series if you want ideas or information on how to write a series successfully if you want tips on both the craft aspects the marketing aspects of on how to capitalize on writing a series you do not want to miss out on this book so in personal news yes i am in south africa it is literally the day before my sister's wedding and so uh great timing i'm actually doing this podcast a little bit early on wednesday the 10th of august uh usually i record on a thursday but both of these episodes are going to be recorded on a uh, wednesday for the next couple of weeks just because i'm in south africa and events mean that that's what i have to do so we have seen some absolutely incredible things already we went to adam's calendar which is the equivalent of uh, the English Stonehenge. It's the basically the African version of that. And um, the oral myths and history around it suggest that it was the birthplace of humans and humanity. And there are a lot of uh, interesting tales uh, that may sound like conspiracies. <laughs> that just makes it all the more fascinating and interesting to me to hear uh, about 
what these tails are. The other thing that I have uh, been to see so far is the Giant's Footprint. Uh, and this is a footprint made in uh, granite and there are lots, lots, lots of information about the uh, composition of the stone versus the stone around it, why the footprint is uh, upright. And I have got some photos which I've been sharing on uh, my Instagram stories. Hopefully some of you have managed to see that. The footprint is about four feet long, maybe five feet long. Uh, I've got a picture, maybe I'll, I'll get the picture to Becca to include in the show notes to just show you just how fucking monstrously large this foot is. And uh, I spoke to our tour guide and he said the foot belonged to a 35 meter giant. <laughs> so... Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, there were a lot. The, the the tour guide talked a lot about uh, the Bible and the uh, Old Testament, I believe, um, where they talk about these certain phrases in the book about giants or, or very huge uh, humans. I don't remember the exact phrasing, uh, so forgive me for that. Um, and so it was very interesting to hear a interpretation on a biblical story uh, with some. A very undeniable evidence of a very large footprint. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it was very exciting and interesting to see. So that has been what has filled me. I think there's an aeroplane going overhead. Um, that has been what has filled the first few days. We're now at the wedding venue and uh, we're going to have the wedding tomorrow. So today is the sort of pre-wedding dinner and um, some activities. And then there's a few days of rest and relaxation uh, afterwards at a resort. And uh, so what have I been doing? Not a lot. <laughs> I will be honest. I came expecting to do lots and lots of uh, work. And of course, I got on the plane and my brain switched off. So <laughs> hey, for all of those people out there who think I don't rest, I'm very, very, very good at resting. <laughs> I just need to be away from my house and uh, my brain will turn off immediately. Uh, so that has been great. I have finished a book, uh, reading a book. I am reading a beta reading a friend's book, but mostly I have just been enjoying looking at the sites and holy shit, there have been some phenomenal landscapes. I feel like my creative well is filling already. And uh, uh, on Instagram again, the sunsets have been possibly my favorite thing here. They, they are jaw-droppingly beautiful down here and it's every single day and they I have taken so many photos of the sunset and you know had inspiration for a couple of lines and bits and things for stories so yes I I did naively think I'd come here and edit all the audio for my audiobook and all the rest of it whereas no but I will do it very quickly when I get home all right well it is breakfast time here so I'm going to hurry up uh, through the rest of this intro and not uh, talk for too long because my family is probably very hungry. The rebel of the week this week is Samira Lloyd. Samira says, I went to primary school at a Steiner school, which for those who don't know, is a hippie school with lots of art, nature, no uniform and emphasis on the children really expressing themselves. If they like to express themselves through the medium of linen veils, all the better. One activity we did in my final year at the Steiner school before high school was to make our own raffia hats, like Anne of Green Gables might wear, or at least that was the aim. Mine had a multicolored bobbly head part and a prim, oh sorry, and a brim with a thick tricolored plaiting that either pointed down like a lampshade or pointed up, uh, sort of like the Pope's hat or like a fruit bowl. I like to wear it pointed up. Then for year seven, I switched to the mainstream uniform wearing public high school. Suffice to say, I did not fit in, but see, I'd done my reading and I understood that not fitting in was cool. None of my favorite characters fit in, so I decided to wear my homemade <laughs> fruit bowl looking hat to school every day for a year oh my goodness me I was renowned literally my entire con uh, ca country town and the two surrounding it knew me as the weird fruit bowl girl every day I would have some version of this conversation them why do you wear that hat it makes you look like a dickhead me because I like it them it looks like a fucking fruit bowl me thank you or even more common them hey fruit bowl can I have some fruit <laughs> One day my friend's nectarine was bruised so I obviously decided to put it in my hat for the inevitable question then walked uh, up towards the canteen. Some random dude immediately stopped me. Some random dude. Hey fruit bowl can I have an apple? Me. No but you can have a nectarine. I passed him the nectarine while smiling innocently. 
Of course, he then threw it. <gasps> he then threw it at me, but it took him so long to recover from that shock that he missed. I stopped wearing the hat in year eight, but it had done the work. I was known as the weirdest girl in school. Oh my God, I fucking love this story so much. That is absolutely hilarious. And like, it's so empowered as well. And like zero fucks are given. And that is just the kind of story that I love. If you would like to be a Rebel of the Week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, big, small, or something in between. You can email your Rebel story to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. No new patrons this week, but a huge, gigantic, enormous, big, fluffy, warm-hearted, gooey, slushy cuddle and hug and thank you from me. If you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as bonus content like blooper reels, of which there is one... <laughs> About to drop. Okay, when I say about to drop, I mean like this month, there will be a blooper reel. Um, and uh, video nights and Rebel Reader Masterclasses and all kinds of amazing stuff. Then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Okay, that is it from me this week. Let's get on with the episode. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. I am so excited because I have one of my actual BFFs on the show today. Susie Speaks is a social media manager and creator of the popular Susie Speaks blog. A Pinterest and Instagram specialist, she has worked with hundreds of authors, bloggers and business owners all over the world to boost their social media platforms and grow their online presence. She lives in Birmingham, UK with her husband and loves writing, musical theatre and exploring new places like Dubrovnik when we went for a girl's holiday. (laughs) Hello and welcome. Hello, it's so nice to speak to you. <laughs> I know, like when I'm not drunk and FaceTiming you with crisp packets and things. <laughs> mini cheddars. Yeah, mini cheddars, that was it. Oh, Susie likes to take screenshots, the bastard, and then send them to me when I'm sober. <laughs> but anyway. Use it for bribery later. <laughs> yeah, to remember when you said. Oh. Right, tell everyone a little bit about you and how, like your journey, how did you get to where you are today? So as you said, uh, I am a blogger and social media manager, um, but for 10 years, I was actually a teacher. I trained as a classical violinist, as you do, and pretty quickly realized after going to university that that was not for me. And then sort of fell into teaching afterwards. And anyone who's ever worked in the education sector knows it's a very challenging job to work in. Um, And so I started writing because writing has always been a form of therapy. And I would go and buy all these gorgeous notebooks and just free write. And they were starting to pile up. And my husband, who's an IT technician, who most people know as the bloke, uh, one day suggested to me, well, why don't you start a blog? And I'd I'd never even heard of a blog, had no idea what it was. And so just randomly signed up for a free WordPress account in 2013 and just started writing nonsense. And then people started liking the nonsense. They they were commenting on it and sending me emails and sharing my posts. And it was like, oh, this is fun. Um, And I had a Facebook account. But bear in mind, when I graduated and was working full time, Facebook or anything didn't exist. It was only launched, I think, 2005. Well, by that point, I was in full-time employment. So, Oh, my um, God. (laughs) (laughs) But nothing existed. So I've had to learn as I've been going along. And when I started sort of building up my own social media accounts, um, I started getting messages from people going, how do I do this? And what's this for? And why do you use that hashtag? And... I thought, oh, perhaps I could do something more with this. And by 2015, again, when I started the blog, there was no expectation or intention behind it. And by 2015, I managed to quit teaching. Um, It wasn't an immediate, right, okay, I'm now walking away from teaching to become a social media manager. It was quite a slow process. So I did supply teaching along with social media management for about a year or so. But since then, I've been doing social media management full time and it's the best job ever. I still remember when you were doing supply and it just feels like a lifetime ago. It was. It was was what? 20, 
2015, I handed in my resignation, started doing supply in the September of that, and then pretty much stopped it a year later. So it, it was a long time ago. When did we meet? 2015. Oh, okay. So it was that year. What then? That yeah. was the first bash that we did. That was the first bloggers bash. Mm. Yeah, I I saw a tweet about it randomly and sent you a message, and and I've said this to you many, 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 many times. That was the life changing sort of sliding doors moment <laughs> oh. where you realise that this is an actual possibility because the blogging world then, even in in sort of 2015, was very different to what it is now. Mm. Um, And it was such an amazing experience. Um, Yeah, it it changed everything. It changed my whole trajectory of of where I'd planned to go. Love that. I love it so much. (laughs) All right. Well, we are here to talk about what you do day to day, which is social media management. So I wondered if we could start with kind of the basics. What do you feel are really good foundations for authors, like the best practice uh, foundations for social media for an author? The biggest thing is consistency. Um, if, If you're putting out a post, it doesn't mean that you have to post every single day, but creating a schedule that works for you Um, So then it doesn't become something that is completely overwhelming because I often find that people come to me and the first thing that they say is, I haven't a clue where to start with this. Um, So yeah, consistency, making sure that it works for you, knowing your schedule. Um, Another one is knowing the audience that you want and that you need, not the audience that you already have. And we're going to talk a bit more in detail about that in a bit. Um, being prepared to put the work in. And that's another thing as well, because people assume that you post something up and you get thousands of followers overnight and you're just famous. Um, Social media is time consuming. It's long hours. Um, Even if you're only just using one or two platforms, um, it's, it's difficult and it changes constantly and evolves constantly. And so you have to relearn as you're going along. Um, And another one is, and this applies to everybody and not just authors, avoiding getting sucked into the whole comparisonitis, as I call it, thing, where you're looking at everybody else, you're comparing yourselves to them, their follower numbers, their content, and suddenly because you're looking at everyone else deciding that you need to do all the things now, um, otherwise it's it's not going to work. So yeah, those, those are my main foundations that you should really have before you even start yeah I think that one about not over not uh underestimating quite how long it takes to to build and grow is really important um (laughs) yeah I I mean I think a lot of authors are semi-aware now just because We all know how hard it is to sell books, but Mm. there is still sometimes that expectation that we can put a post out and it, and the thing is as well, the algorithms change so bloody often that, you know, I'll put one post out and get like three likes and then I'll put another one out and get 173 likes. And it's just like, sometimes I feel like I'm chucking needles in haystacks, (laughs) hoping for the better, hoping I hit a mouse, you know? Oh, definitely. I mean, you're, you're essentially, and, and again, this will come up later on. You are at the mercy of those social media platforms. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Um, So you basically have to do your best to stay on track with what your goal is rather than getting sucked into the whole, well, I need to do this, 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 and this has changed. It, it, It gets too much otherwise. Yeah. So let's talk about creating a platform and optimizing a platform. Like, what does that even mean? Everybody always talks about optimizing this and optimizing fucking that. Like, what does that actually mean? Like, how does one optimize? (laughs) Well, optimizing. Yeah. Um, What are the tactics? So there's basically two sections to optimizing. So optimizing your social media generally means using your social media networks to manage, grow your audience, uh, grow the message that you're trying to get out there and what you're trying to sell. So in this case, we're talking authors. So we're talking about books and everything related to that. 
Um, as a digital marketing strategy, when you're looking at individual platforms, social media optimization is mainly focused around keywords of the audience that you want to attract. And I keep saying this want rather than the audience that you already have. Um, so, for example, if you're looking at a platform like Twitter, um, Twitter is a, a really successful platform for authors and there's a huge book audience on there. Um, and so you're competing with millions, or literally millions of other authors. Um, so you have to make yourself stand out um, by optimizing your profile, um, particularly in the bio section. So say, for example, if you are a YA author, you would put that in your bio, YA author, and include a hashtag or two as well, because people find you through hashtags. Um, putting the keywords in, um, as succinctly as possible without sort of rambling at the top will really help to explain to a potential follower as to who you are, what you do, what your books are about and why they should read them. And it's other things as well that people don't often talk about of having a, a cover header that makes sense. So if you've written a whole series of books, you know, have the header with your books um, in there, having a logo of you know, a nice picture of you. Um, it still surprises me the sort of profile pictures that people will put up and then want to sell something um, because everything is very visual and people will look at it in a glance and just go, nope, based on that picture alone. Um, so that's really sort of optimization. Sometimes the details that you're asked for on social media, I don't necessarily agree with. I never put down my address. I never put down my main contact details, but it is useful to add in things like an email address should someone want to contact you, um, particularly, you know, about your your books, um, including links to your author website or your Amazon um, or, you know, if you have a link tree or things like that, including all those in your bio as well. Just explain what a link tree is in case people haven't heard of it. So a link tree is something where, say, for example, if you have um, a particular um, you've got, you know, 10,000 links to different places that are advertising different things, a link tree will put it all into one place. So when you click on the link tree link, you'll then be taken to a section where you've got, say, you know, latest release and then author website or, you know, free download. And it just allows you to combine all those links together. Yeah, yeah. That, and I actually use Linktree as well. And I find that super useful, although I am a bit shit at updating it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is super useful. Um, OK, it, do we need to optimize posts at all? Is that, <laughs> is that a thing? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I mean, sometimes it, it, it doesn't have to be every single post, but it's the important post that you're looking at. So um, say, for example, you have a new release. Well, what are those keywords in that that new release that you want people to find you? And hashtags, what hashtags are you going to be using with that as well? Um, a launch post needs to be done in a way where, you know, you want a little bit of information about what the book is about, why people should buy it, you know, or if you've sent out advanced copies, you know, reviews that you've had from it and the hashtags that go with it. So using those keywords that match your book in that will, will help to, you know, get it out there. How it, well, like, how do you know what a good hashtag is? Like, is there a method of searching for them? Do you just use like a generator from a website? Like how does one find good hashtags? <laughs> You can use a generator. Um, there is a hashtag for everything, but when you're looking for the most popular hashtags, the, the way that I find them, particularly if you're going on Instagram and things like that, you can type in a hashtag and it will actually tell you how many millions of times it's been used oh, within okay. a certain amount of time. So it's useful to sort of uh, keep a note of those and the more popular ones that are used regularly use them regularly as well. Another one, um, uh, another way of, of finding sort of decent hashtags is to look at people who have much larger follower numbers and very popular posts and see what hashtags they're using. And there's a bit of a myth to do with hashtags as well is that you get a maximum of 30 on um, Instagram, um, but some people, you know, use four or five. They just need to be relevant um, you don't have to use all 30 every time. 
Okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I think that's such a great tip about looking at like, say if there's a really popular bookstagrammer or whatever and seeing what they're actually posting. Um, yeah, I, I love that. I think that's a great idea. I think I know what I'm going to be doing. Where's a certain new genre that I'm going to be writing in. <laughs> Daily. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Still with pride. Um, <laughs> Okay, what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes that authors use when trying to use social media? There's so many. I've narrowed it down to two. Um, <laughs> <so> <laughs> You're all <laughs> shit. So <laughs> many. Um, we, we talked about it sort of earlier on, um, but this is the biggest thing for me, is not looking at the audience that you want and you need for the type of books that you write rather than the audience that you already have. Now, if you have, you know, a, a lot of people I'm assuming who are listening are going to have just a, a private Facebook page. And then if you start another social media platform, it, say on, we'll take Instagram, for example, um, some of your friends who follow you on, uh, who you're friends with on Facebook, you know, your nan, your uncle, things like that, they'll follow you on your Instagram page as well. Um, but what you're really looking for is, who are your readers? Who do you think your book is targeted towards? What type of readers would enjoy your book? Um, and you're looking at the whole demographics of that. So again, I'm, I'm just going to use sort of, you know, young adult fiction author as an example, because that's a lot of the type of social media authors that I, I work with. You know, what type of, of people read YA stuff? Um, how can you best market your books to that? Um, and also as well, um, with that, um, it's not about the follower numbers. And I know like, I know this is probably going to be like, well, of course it is. It's not. I've seen accounts that have tens of thousands, of, literally tens of thousands of followers, and they get absolutely no engagement, no comments, no likes, no shares. You know, people really aren't interested. They've just played a really good game to build up those follower numbers. And then I've seen accounts that have less than a thousand that are getting hundreds of likes and comments and, and shares and things like that. And so authors often equate follower numbers to sales and it's not, um, that's not the case at all. The, the important thing about your followers is that it's followers who are interested in you, interested in your books. And most importantly, they're interested in purchasing them and reading them. Um, so I think that's a huge mistake and it's something that I have to battle with with clients all the time because their expectations is that they want those massive follower numbers and of course that's great and it's great to see an account grow um, but at the same time it, it's not going to make any difference sort of just mass following 3,000 people if you're going to get zero sales out of it I'd rather follow you know two three hundred to get people who would actually be interested in buying your books. Um, and is also connected with that. So I suppose it's three rather than two, is that if you post up, you're suddenly going to get 10,000 followers overnight. That's not going to happen. You're not going to get 10,000 followers in a year. You know, if you're just posting a day, once a day, what comes with it is, is the time and the interaction and the engagement and getting to know people and letting them get to know you. Um, and yeah, people often forget that you, you aren't going to post and suddenly get all of these followers. It's very rare. Get rid of the word viral. There's no such thing. It's, it's a, a lucky combination of the right algorithm and perhaps the right people sharing it at that particular time. Yeah. Lightning bolts. That's what they are. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of, well, anyway, that's a whole nother <laughs> conversation. <laughs> How can, how can authors better understand social media? Like what should they be studying or looking up? Like how should they like research the platform or their audience or yeah, like how can we better understand? So, I mean, what I mentioned it before is the fact of that you are at the complete mercy of the social media platforms themselves. Um, for example, Meta has just made over the last month or so huge changes in how posts are scheduled, how pages are managed, and there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. Um, Pinterest made massive changes uh, a couple of years ago, which impacted hugely on, on, on thousands and thousands of people. Um, so with things like that, I think 
you know, you said it yourself, you know, you can put up a post and it will get three likes and you'll put another post up and it will get, you know, hundreds. Um, so that's really important to remember that really you could do all, you could plan it all and map it all and research it all, but essentially you are at the mercy of what, what it is they decide to do and what changes um, they decide to make. However, it is important to understand the functionality of a platform. So everybody, you know, once they've been on social media for a little while, have a basic understanding of how putting up a post on social media works. And obviously that functionality will vary depending on the platform that you're, you're using. Um, but there are so many things behind the scenes that you can actually do on those platforms that you may not necessarily know um, exist. Um, so, I mean, even basics um, of how to create a really interesting story. There's so many different things that you can include in a story from graphics and music and links and, and all sorts of things. Because again, that's changed more recently where it used to be, I think it was only people with over 10,000 Instagram followers could add in a link and that's now changed. Everybody can do it now. Um, so start off by learning exactly what the functionality of that platform is and learn as much as possible about it. There are plenty of articles, tutorials. I mean, we're talking millions, um, but a really important thing when you're reading up on something or watching a tutorial is to make note of when that content was created. Because what I've dealt with over the last couple of years is that I've had social media clients sending me a link to something going, oh, we could do this. And it was written in 2016 and is no longer relevant. So be aware that it's actually up-to-date information that you're researching. Um, and also as well, trial and error is, is always a really good thing. And um, particularly if you're just starting out, making note of if you put up a post that has done better than the others, what has worked for that? Why, why has it done much better? What hashtags did you use? Did you reply to any comments that you received? Who shared it out? And if so, you know, <laughs> what impact did that have on that? So not just researching what other people do, because you, you can look at what everyone else is doing out there, but also looking at what you're doing and how that has worked and trying to replicate it in some sort of way. Yeah. Yeah, like there are so many things that change on like social media. And I, for one, I'm very grateful that we now have the link out on, yeah. <laughs> on Instagram. And it's yeah. funny because, um, you know, there are things like creating a shop. You, you can actually create like an Instagram shop and link out to, you can, you can like link products in your posts, like on your images and stuff, which is crazy. I mean, like that's a bit technically too advanced for me, but um, it, there are so many things that don't get utilized that you could use to help um, push and promote your uh, work. So yeah, maybe I should do that for the next book launch. Anyway, <laughs> you've been, you've talked a couple of times about, how authors need to consider not the audience that they have, but the audience that they want to grow. So mm -hmm. what kind of content should they be producing? What kind of things should authors do to attract and connect with um, that kind of audience? How do they know what to create? So obviously the, the main focus is book promotional content because that's why you have the platforms in the first place. Um, with the book promotional content, you're not just talking book covers because you've got an opportunity for cover reveals and things. And I've seen you do plenty over the years that just look amazing. Um, but info about the books themselves. So again, I'm using um, YA fiction just because that's what I deal with a lot. Um, what type of people are interested in YA fiction? Um, what sort of characters that are in your book do you think those those readers would be interested in? Um, you can include graphics, information about any release dates, upcoming sales, flash sales, any reviews that you've had from any uh, advanced copies that you've sent out, you know, creating a bit of a buzz about it. Um, but also once it's been launched, you know, any brilliant reviews that you've received afterwards. Um, and really fun ones that I always love putting out on client social media accounts is, 
if somebody has bought an author's book and then sends them a picture of themselves reading that book somewhere um, or they've taken it on holiday with them and things like that, every author I've ever worked with loves receiving messages like that. So mm -hmm. sharing a picture of readers actually enjoying your book and linking them into that and, and it, it, it builds up a bit of a buzz. Um, so obviously you've got all of the book promotional content and that can also include sort of beautiful pictures of bookstagram um flat lays now flat lays are overhead um photos of your book surrounded by things that make it look pretty essentially um but it's better to try and include things that are actually related to the the book and the story itself um if you check out the bookstagram hashtag on instagram there's millions, uh, millions and millions of, of really stunning, beautiful, fairly easy to, to recreate images. Um, so those are always visually eye-catching, visually pleasing, will draw somebody in if you're on a visual platform like Pinterest and like uh, Instagram. But it isn't just about your books. Some of the more popular accounts that I see are the ones who share a little bit of information about themselves as an author. So what inspires and motivates them? Where do they get their ideas from? So for example, I follow an author that posts up places that she goes to when she's looking for writing inspiration. She'll actually sort of go off on holiday for a few days and she'll put up pictures of where she goes and, and explain how it inspires her. Um, and I'm not an author, but I really like reading those sorts of posts. I find it interesting. Um, or have you you know, been to somewhere yourself as an author or as a reader. Um, so have you been to an author event? You know, is there a picture of you signing a book for somebody? Because that's always such a huge buzz with any author that I ever speak to. If someone comes over and asks them to sign a copy of their own book, it's like, oh, yes, yes, I will. Um, or what about if you go to book or writing based events like the London Book Fair? Um I mean, I've learned so much about that from you over the years and, you know, taking short videos when you're there and posting them up, putting up pictures of the people that you meet, pictures of the people who are speaking, um, all of those sorts of things. Um, or more about your own daily life. Are you writing a new chapter? Are you currently editing something? Um, something that made me laugh where... Um, an author was uh, editing something and her dog had come over and basically just plonked a toy in the middle of the notepad um, while she was in the middle of editing. And that, that made me smile. Um, so, you know, things that, that make people laugh, it's not a buy my book, buy my book. It was, okay, my dog's just come over and destroyed my editing process. Um, that That's always fun. Um, what about the books that you like to read? I mean, we're in the middle of a heat wave. Have you been out in the back garden um, reading your your favorite book? You know, can we have a picture of like the hot dog legs with with the garden in the background and, you know, the book and a, a nice sort of drink with ice in the background and things listen, like that? Listen, Susie, <laughs> no one needs to see my hot dog legs. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you only need to look at the sun and you just go brown. I know, I know. I, know. I, I no. never do a hot dog leg one because I, I just go sweaty and purple and then back to the sort of milk bottle white again. Um, and also as well, and not everybody feels comfortable about this, but if you do feel comfortable, what about, you know, you as a person? Have you gone on a day trip somewhere? You know, what are you up to? What do you like? Have you eaten a really fantastic sandwich that day? Because sometimes sandwiches <laughs> really pull in the audience, believe it or not. You're um, fucking kidding me. <laughs> no, honestly, some of the some of the brunch pictures that I've put out, honestly, they, they just fly. People love food, they love animals, they love babies, they love sort of pictures of really nice places. Um, it's not all about the books. Add in a bit of humor, add in a bit of like sandwich. Why not? You know, switch it up a little bit. Make people interested in you. I love it. All right. That was a fuck ton of ideas. So I really hope everybody has a pen and pencil because <laughs> there's so many things I need to write down. So, okay, fine. We're producing content. We're mm -hmm. posting content. We're doing stories. Yeah. What 
what next? How do we know if it's working? What should we what should we be measuring? I know you mentioned earlier a misperception around um, follow followers. So if we're not tracking followers, what should we be tracking? So your insights, um, they're called insights on all of your individual platforms. And those are basically your analytics, your data, your stats about how your posts have performed. Um, And there's different sort of measuring tools that different people use. So looking at things like reach, how many posts have, how many people have your posts reach over a certain number of time? What has been your most popular post in terms of the amount of likes and comments that you get? Comments, I always prefer more than likes because somebody has been so moved by what you've put up in whatever form, they've taken the time to write something to you. Um, you know, do you reply to those? Um, is um, with When it comes to sort of looking at your analytics, is there a particular post that did really well when you posted it out at a specific time? Um, looking at all of those stats um, is is often really useful. Sometimes as well, platforms will give you a suggested post in time. I don't necessarily always agree with that, um, purely because obviously they they give it in uh, an American time frame, which being based in the UK, it, it's not always relevant to be posting out a post at 10 o'clock at night, which is what I saw on one set of stats recent, recently. And it's like, nope, I'm not doing that. Um, but yeah, um, and looking back and analyzing what it is that has done particularly well. When I do stats analysis for clients, I always, 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 before they start, uh, take a full stats analysis of the previous month. Because sometimes when you're staring at a social media account every day, there doesn't seem to have been much improvement in growth. And then when you then add it all up at the end of the next month, you can see it and the numbers have gone straight up and you're thinking, wow, okay, that's better than I thought. Um, So actually writing down your social media numbers will, will really help to sort of boost what's doing well and things like that. So really that's, those are the sorts of measures I, I use um, particularly with the end of month stats analysis. It's funny. I used to absolutely hate data analysis as a teacher. And now I love it when it gets to the end of the month, because I can do a whole bunch of stats analysis. It's, it, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Because I don't particularly enjoy numbers. I don't really like spreadsheets, but I have a couple that I use to track like my output and my yeah. word count. And I love those yeah. spreadsheets. It's so funny. <laughs> um, All right. So authors are really busy people, you know, quite often they still have a day job um, and they're trying to write in the evening um, and then also build platforms. So are there any tools that you use that are particularly helpful or are are there any shortcuts that people can take um, or systems or whatever to to produce more content more more consistently? Schedulers. Schedulers are the biggest help to any social media manager. Um, What schedulers do is is essentially, you know, what it says in the name. It allows you to schedule your posts out in advance. So that, say, for example, if you wanted to send out a post at 5.30 in the evening, but you're going to be busy at that time, you can prepare a post, get it scheduled out, and then it will automatically go out at that time while you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. There's loads of different schedulers available. Um, I use Buffer um, for certain platforms. Uh, I use the Meta Facebook um, schedulers. Those have, have changed a little bit recently, so I'm sort of having to relearn bits and pieces. I've also used Content Cal. Um, over the years as well and that's really that's really great Um, that's super useful and what I've found is that Meta uh, their scheduling tool now looks much more like Content Cal so it wasn't as big of a change as perhaps it it was for other people who haven't used it but there are loads out there Um, and for what you get for the year they're relatively reasonably priced Meta is free you have to have a Meta business suite Um, but I I pay sort of a relatively small amount for a buffer. Um, Yeah, so using schedules, uh, schedulers is definitely the biggest tool that you can use to make it easier. 
And also as well, and, and this is probably like, you know, um, everybody already knows this anyway, but you don't have to be a qualified graphic designer to create really nice graphics fairly easily. I use Canva. I've always used Canva. I've used Canva for years. Um, their functionality is is fantastic. Um, when you look at it compared to what it was sort of years ago, um, and you can get a free version and you can get a paid version, um, and they're really great. And you can actually create, you know, videos, moving graphics, um, all sorts of different things. So Canva really saves me a lot of time and it saves me money because I don't have to work with a graphic designer as well then. Yeah. Um, those are my two biggest tools that I use throughout the week to be able to sort of make my my life easier. Yeah, I adore Canva. I've I've had a pro account for a really long time. I absolutely love it. The um, scheduler, I use later.com. Uh, just because oh, yeah. I, yeah, later is quite a good one that um, mm-hmm. I use. But then there's, like, there's probably a thousand others that I could go and look at just because I've been using it for so long. I haven't gone and checked oh, any of the others. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the only problem you have with a lot of the schedulers that are out there is that they don't have the ability to post to Instagram. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, later does, uh, content cow does, and obviously, you know, meta business suite does, um, using creator studio that does. Um, so if you're looking at, at Instagram in particular, you know, focus on, on those instead. All right. So I know because we're good friends that some of the things that you do are creating social media strategies. Mm -hmm. So like what even is a social media strategy and how can authors create one to help themselves grow? So for me, I've always worked on the idea of that a, a strategy is exactly that. You're creating a plan of how you intend to grow your platforms in advance Um, But there's so many different things that are involved in a strategy, depending on who you are and what it is that you're trying to sell. So um, a strategy will start off with a general overview of what your main goals are and those deadlines for it. But then you're looking at the individual deadlines and goals as you go along. So um, again, we're going back to looking at your own books who is the book marketed towards? Who is the audience that you want, not the audience that you already have? Um, say, for example, if you are releasing a, a, a book coming up soon, you know, I've had many, many, many conversations with you over the years. I had no idea it was so complicated. <laughs> you know, but you're looking at, okay, so that's the end goal, that's the launch date. But what about all those little steps on the way up? to that point even after you've done the whole sort of you know writing proof rewriting you know ten thousand drafts sending it off to an editor dealing with you know loads of different um graphics ideas what does the cover look like and then you get into the okay so uh when are we doing the cover release um are we are we gonna send it out across you know, this particular platform, are you going to only send it to people who are signed up to your mailing list as like, a, hmm, you know, something. And then you put on your social media, you have to join my mailing list to see my cover reveal. It's, it's, it's all interlinked. Um, so yeah, those little goals, as you're going along, you map out what it is that you want to post when you plan to post it, what effect really that you want it to have, how it all interlinks um, and planning that out in advance and scheduling it out. You don't necessarily have to do the whole thing in one go. Obviously, if you're still in the editing stage, you're not going to be able to sort of plan it out that far ahead, but you can still map out a general time frame of what it is that you want and just, just work down that really. Amazing. All right. Last question before the ultimate podcast question. Mm -hmm. Uh, What are some of the ways that um, authors can collaborate to build their following? Like, should you collaborate? Is that a bad idea now? Like, how do we approach influences? Are there any like best practices that we should follow? So collaboration is always good if it's done well. There's two different types of influences in my head, although I'm sure there's tons of people who will argue with me. So you've got the big influencers, and you've got the micro influencers. 
if you're wanting to work with a large influencer and we're talking purely based on on follower numbers is what people assume um you want to be able to approach them in a way of that okay so you know i i have a book i would really like you to have a read and review it and give me your honest opinion and there will usually be a charge that comes with that so if somebody has built up their accounts they may say, okay, I want this amount of money and I will do an honest review and make sure that you always ask for an honest review because I think the 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 pitfall when you're dealing with the whole sort of social media, you know, influencer thing is that many people become distrustful of stuff when everybody puts up, oh my God, this is the best thing I have ever read or eaten or best place I've ever been because they've been paid to say that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you want someone who always gives honest reviews. Um, when you're also looking at dealing with, you know, sort of larger influences in particular, you're not just looking at the follower numbers, you're looking at the level of engagement that they get. If they've got 50,000 followers and only get sort of 10 likes and no comments, what's the point? Nobody's interested in their content. You're wasting your time and your money. So you want someone who has a large following, but they also have an engaged and excited audience as well. Um, so that will more than likely sort of drum up a little bit of promotion, potentially a few sales, things like that. But what I've also found to be really effective as well is working with influencers is to use micro influencers. So the ones who have 10,000 followers or less or, uh, you know, even 5,000 followers or less, if they have an excellent engagement rate, you're more likely to be able to send them your book for free. So it's not going to cost you anything other than the book and the postage. Um, they're really excited because their, their accounts are a lot newer. Um, they're more sort of eager and enthusiastic. You're more likely to get more posts out of, out of those sorts of influences as well, because it's a, it's a more sort of, um, you, yeah, they're, they're more excited to be able to, be reviewing things and and want to be able to build up that side of promotion for themselves as well. Um, So just as an example, I ran, I've run multiple sort of micro influencer campaigns over the last few years. Um, And we did a little bit of a test with one of them where we sent off something to 25 micro influencers and then one large influencer who's following basically sort of you know, matched the micro influencers and the amount of overall sort of levels of engagement from the micro influencers when added up completely trounced the massive influencer. Um, so it's, it is really interesting, you know, you can combine it, you know, ask a few larger influencers, get some micro influencers involved in that as well. When you're approaching an influencer, it is always, you know, better to be polite because <laughs> you'd be surprised like the amount of messages I say from people of oi <laughs> give me your product for free um, you're kidding no it's there's a lot of that going on there's a there's a lot of self-entitlement I think that comes with the whole sort of influencer idea so it's like okay so if I've got 8,000 followers you need to give me your stuff for free so try and avoid working with those sorts of people um And also as well, when you're approaching an influencer, make sure that they are actually interested in your type of book and your type of sort of audience and your genre and everything that you are looking to promote. There's no point sending um, a fiction book to someone who completely, you know, ignores fiction 99% of the time. So yeah, do a lot of research into it. Be very polite, be very respectful. Don't get dragged into, you know, the looking at the follower numbers above anything else um, and create a spreadsheet (laughs) about it. Again, I hate data. I love a good micro-influencer spreadsheet. You know, track how many responses that they've got. So when you then release your next book, the ones who have done particularly well and were really great to work with, approach them again. You're creating a list then of, you know, your, your audience, your set audience, um, so yeah, that's that's one of the the big ways of of collaboration. Amazing. Well, 
This <laughs> is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Well, I took a day off. <laughs> <laughs> Outrageous. How dare you? <laughs> I did nothing. Um, I would probably say, because I was a good girl. I was always a good girl. I was always the, you know, top set, do good. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd punch myself in the face if I had to go to school with me now. Um, but when I was 17, uh, a group of friends and I decided that we wanted to go out um, for a night on the town. Um, and we, we lived in a, where we were was a relatively rural area. I can't believe I'm telling this actually, but it's the most rebellious thing I've ever done in my entire life. So we all told our parents that we were staying at each other's houses because we'd been friends since the first day of, of secondary school. So all our families knew each other. And then we went into our local town. And because I was 17 and a complete lightweight, um, I got very drunk, like very drunk within about 45 minutes of walking into the first place. And so two hours later, I don't know, I still don't remember actually getting into that club, but I was in a club vomiting in the sink and the bouncer had to physically remove me. Um, and so by that point, I mean, we had the whole night to ourselves and uh, yeah, I was done by about 10 o'clock. <laughs> and instead, because we'd all told each other that we were staying, told our parents that we were staying at each other's houses, um, what we actually did was set up a tent in a field, oh not that God. far from where I actually lived, which it, thinking about the the safety of it now, but it, it, it was, you know, it was a, I was very lucky. It was a proper sort of Enid Blyton-esque sort of area. Um, and so we just dumped a tent in one of the fields. And um, yeah, so after being thrown out of the, the nightclub, my friends took pity on me and we all came back and built this tent in the dark. It was freezing. It was like minus two. It was one of the coldest nights oh of the year. Oh, my God. We built this tent, and I had a bottle of, at the time, it was Body Shop, Japanese musk. And because I um, had, had thrown up, I threw it everywhere, all over the tent in a drunken state, uh, and basically just passed out while the rest of my friends stayed up. And we couldn't really put the tent up properly either, so we just sort of stuck a pole in the middle and we were all just <laughs> lying there in between these two tent sheets in the middle of a field um yeah and then when I woke up in the morning it wasn't far from my house so all I did was just get up and go home <laughs> <laughs> and I so left, left them all to deal with it <laughs> and my parents had no idea why I turned up at like half past six in the morning stink <laughs> vomit and Japanese musk um and yeah so oh I'd say God, it's the I most rebellious it. thing I've ever done, I think. Yeah. And, and at 40, the most rebellious thing I've ever done is taking a day off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there are things we can't talk about on the podcast, but uh, I love it. I love very it. Lame. It's very lame. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everyone where they can find out more about you and your services and anything else that you would like to add. So I am at uh, suzy81speaks.com. Um, if you want to sort of read about my my random nonsense on the internet, um, you can find me on Suzy81 blog on Twitter. You can find me on Suzy Speaks on Instagram uh, and on Pinterest, I think. I am on LinkedIn, but haven't actually posted anything on there for about a year and a half. Um, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. <laughs> my social media account. I found that a lot, actually. My social media accounts are absolutely terrible because I spend my whole day working on everybody else's. Um, or you can email me at uh, suzy81blog at hotmail.co.uk um, if, if you're interested in any sort of author social media ideas. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. And of course, a gigantic thank you to all of the show's listeners and all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, then you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. 
I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Susie Speaks, and this was the Revel Author Podcast. I'm joined by Lucinda Halpern, who is a literary agent. I think this is the first agent we've had on the show, so this should be an exciting episode, both for uh, because Lucinda is also quite indie focused. So it is a great episode for both those hoping to go traditionally uh, down the traditional publishing route, and also indie authors looking to work with literary agents more. So join me next week for that don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher and when you have a moment please leave a review